Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Smaha and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing Communications. Thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation, Understanding Bird Migration. Evan Dalton, our lead instructor of land bird conservation is a fantastic educator and you're all in for a very interesting discussion this evening. If you're new to Manomet, we are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit. Since Manomet's beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts based bird banding operation. With shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries and more, Manomet has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future for us and the birds. Tonight's webinar is made possible through the support of our generous sponsors to our end of summer campaign. I'd like to take a moment to thank and recognize Howland Capital, Hemingway and Barnes, Eagle Mirror Foundation, Rockland Trust, Rogers Gray, Boston Trust Walden Company, Prime Buckles, and Alpha Pension Group. For more information about our end of summer campaign and our sponsors, visit manomet.org slash summer2020 or click on the link in the chat box. Just a few things before we begin tonight. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. Emily Renault will be monitoring the Q&A and we will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of tonight's presentation, it will be recorded. And I see some people are already asking. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. So again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now I'd like to turn it over to Evan Dalton to share the mysteries of bird migration. Excellent, thank you, Danielle. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm told there are multiple people on here at the moment, so that's always a good sign. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out on a Tuesday night. I know for many of you, it's probably hard to keep track of the day of the week. Uh, I certainly feel that way. I think we're all living in strange times. But that being said, uh, one of the most calming things out there, in my opinion, uh, is the fact that um, regardless of what happens in the human world, uh, birds continue migrating. And it's the seasonal uh, passages of time and, and seasonal uh, uh, phenomena that we encounter out there. Uh, they kind of let us know that, um, you know, things are going to be all right with or without us. So it's all nice. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about uh, migration here. We're going to go through the night and we'll, we'll cover a little bit about uh, what migration is. Um, and then we'll focus on birds in particular. Uh, we'll talk about um, why birds migrate and how they do it. Uh, and we'll talk about how people have been studying migration as well. Um, that's one of the big things that we do at Manomet, um, but it's also something that's uh, pretty fascinating uh, and, and done by many of our partners and, and other scientists and, and hobbyists as well. Um, and we'll sort of finish up with a, a few examples of uh, species that you might encounter if you go out uh, right now and, and look for uh, migrants. And uh, yeah, then we'll, we'll, we'll call it night after a little bit of question and answer. So. Um, yeah, I think people will be typing things into the uh, chat window and our moderators uh, will be uh, keeping track of all those questions. And uh, at the end, I'll, I'll do my best to address those. So migration is just the seasonal movements of a species or a, a population of animals. Um, birds aren't the only things that migrate. Um, in the Northeast, where uh, pretty well aware of the uh, movements of the North Atlantic right whale, um, which actually moves through in the spring, but then also uh, moves through um, in the late summer as well, not as, not as uh, uh, easily seen at that point in time. But uh, these whales are moving up into uh, the Bay of Fundy to uh, capitalize on booming uh, anadromous fish up there, uh, things like capelin, um, and uh, which are kind of like herring down here. Um, so these are fish that school in great numbers uh, as they go to um, uh, freshwater uh, streams and whatnot that are that are spilling out into the Atlantic and these these whales just sort of scarf them down. 
Um, also, we've got our, our insect, our probably our most famous insect migrant, the monarch. Um, monarch butterflies actually take multiple generations to move north every spring into the summer. Um, and then about now is when the uh, northernmost populations, uh, instead of living a few weeks, they actually live uh, three, four, five months. Um, and they'll migrate instead of sticking put. They'll migrate south all the way to the mount mountains of uh, central Mexico, uh, spend the winter there, kind of grouped together. And you see this photo here in the lower right. Uh, they look like leaves on the pine trees, uh, but those are in fact butterflies. Um, and then once uh, things warm up a little bit, uh, they're probably triggered by photo period or the day length. Um, they take off and head to the Gulf Coast and start the whole process over again. So um, pretty interesting. But these are two examples of uh, migrations that are spurred on by two different things. So uh, for the whales, it's actually a food resource that they're migrating to uh, take advantage of. Um, but as far as the monarchs are concerned, I guess you could say that they're taking advantage of summertime food um, and um, nesting sites uh, or, or food plants for their caterpillars. Um, but they're migrating south out of necessity as far as temperatures go. Um, so they could not survive the winter uh, otherwise. Whereas the whales, when they're heading south into the, uh, towards the Caribbean, uh, they're actually going to a place that has much less food, uh, but they're actually going there to raise their calves. Um, so as far as birds go, it's always been a mystery to people as to what the heck they do. Uh, people have been noticing that birds leave usually around the fall in the northern hemisphere. Um, and you'll see them moving about and then they'll just be gone. Um, early theories as to where the heck they went. Some people thought that birds actually transmuted into other animals or other birds. Um, some folks even thought that swallows hibernated in the mud at the bottom of lakes. You can see this uh, old engraving here on the lower left that shows uh, some folks pulling out some fish and uh, some swallows. Uh, we now know these are not true. Uh, some folks even thought that birds flew all the way up to the moon um, and spent the winter there. Um, these ideas seem ridiculous at the time, but uh, if you had told them that these birds instead are flying thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of miles each year, um, I think they might find that even less believable. So why migrate? Like I said, food is a major driver of migration. Um, you can see down here in the lower right hand corner, we've got this herd of wildebeest, which is a, 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 a famous phenomenon um, across the plains of Africa. Um, and these wildebeest are famously following uh, seasonal rain patterns. Um, and they obviously are ungulates, so they have to feed on grass and whatnot. Um, and after they capitalize on feeding grass in one spot, they've got to move to another. So they're actually following seasonal rains um, and their migration is very food driven. Um, other things that drive it are temperature. So if certain things uh, can't survive in a cold winter, um, they've got to move out. Um, in the case of birds, they're actually quite good at surviving uh, through cold temperatures or cold spells as long as they can find food. So for birds, a lot of their migratory patterns are dictated by food. Um, I will also say that opportunity plays a major part in things, as does day length. Um, so if you think of our friends, the snowy owls that come down into the States um, and have big years every so often, um, they often are flying around during the daytime. Um, and if you think about it, during the summer and whatnot, they've got plenty of day length up north in the Arctic Circle. Uh, but once winter rolls around, uh, it's pretty much dark all the time up there. Um, so it's much easier for them to find food when they migrate a little bit further south. Even if there are a few hours of daylight, it's better than zero. Um, opportunity does play a big part. Um, and in speaking about temperature, we're gonna talk a little bit about ice. Now it was about 90 something here today. So Definitely a nice time to be talking about ice ages. Um, but in, the, uh, in, in our continent, uh, although I'm not exactly sure where everybody is, uh, but in North America, 
um, a lot of the migration that happens here uh, did not happen uh, at least to its current extent uh, as recently as maybe 10 or 15,000 years ago. Um, that's when the Laurentide and Cordilleran uh, ice sheets were spreading all across uh, northern North America. You guys can see my cursor here. This is kind of a weird image in that it's looking down from the North Pole. Uh, North America is here in the lower right. And this blue here shows the southernmost extent of the last glaciation, which was around 10, 15,000 years ago. Um, and you can see that uh, the greater part of northern North America was just covered in a thick sheet of ice. Uh, that's what did things like create uh, uh, Cape Cod when it expanded and contracted. Um, but it also meant that a large swath of uh, potential breeding area was actually covered up. And if we think of our ancestral bird species, we're going to think about um, a species of bird called a yellow rumped warbler. Um, and if we think of an ancestor of theirs that used to breed in northern North America during the spring and summer, uh, it obviously didn't have much of a place to breed there. Um, but when these things started receding, um, this ancestor warbler was actually able to come back. Um, and what ended up happening was it came back uh, both in the east and in the south, um, and or in the west. Um, and what ended up happening even over the course of only 10,000 years um, was a little bit of differentiation. Um, so the interbreeding on the east coast um, left uh, a subspecies of the yellow warbler called a myrtle warbler here. It's got a white throat. Um, and on the west coast, there's a species called, or a subspecies of the yellow rump warbler called the Audubon's warbler. Um, it's got a yellow throat. Um, it also doesn't have a white stripe above its eye, which this guy has, the myrtle warbler. Um, and it's pretty interesting that we can actually see signs of, of um, this differentiation from east and west um, that are extremely recent in sort of evolutionary uh, time scale. Um, but now that the ice sheets have finally receded, um, and if you looked at the pattern of how they receded, they really left a big swath of eastern forest and then some western uh, mount mountainous forest here um, when they receded initially. Um, and that's really where these things actually speciated, which is kind of cool. So at this point, without, um, without any ice in the way, uh, migration is really part of this annual cycle of a bird's life. Um, and this is sort of a simplified representation of the life cycle of sort of a northern hemisphere uh, bird. Uh, so if we think of spring is when we see a lot of these birds starting to return from their wintering grounds. Um, and once they come back to their, to their breeding grounds, they begin breeding. That's when we hear them singing. Um, they, if, if they're fortunate, they actually raise young. Um, and we're really at this period of time right here between summer and fall. And this is a period of time when people notice to drop off in activity in their backyards. Um, you might notice that you're not hearing as many birds singing. Um, that's because most of the birds are not maintaining their territory at this point. Um, they're kind of done and packing up shop. Um, in a lot of cases, or in some cases, um, species have even left. So at this point, uh, you'd be really hard pressed to find species like orchard orioles here in New England right now. Um, they're gone already, which is pretty amazing. Um, so these birds then migrate south, and then they spend a long portion of their lives, or a very large portion of their lives, overwintering. We like to think of birds that breed up here as, as our birds but really they're kind of on holiday when they see us and they spend most of their time in the overwintering grounds. Um, but once they're done overwintering and, and they receive some sort of ecological trigger, um, be it a change in day length um, or some sort of a clock me mechanism that's going on inside their brains, um, they get uh, triggered, uh, certain hormones start raging in their bodies um, and they start preparing for migration. Now migration is a really, uh, we'll learn about some pretty amazing feats that birds do, but it's a uh, pretty strenuous activity, obviously, um, for birds. There are a lot of constraints around it. A lot of these birds are traveling very long distances. Um, they've got to fly at pretty high altitudes, a lot of them. 
Uh, they're prone to wind directions. Uh, they, you know, if you're a bird, they can fly maybe 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour tops. Um, if you've got a 20 or 30 mile an hour headwind, you're not really going to, or wind that's right in your face, um, you're really not going to be able to make much, uh, much headway. So um, they're very subject to uh, winds that are happening out there. And also in the fall, they're subject to seasonal storms. So right now it's kind of an unprecedented time. We've got uh, two hurricanes uh, that are basically in the Gulf of Mexico almost at the same time. Um, so that's uh, something that's definitely going to be grounding a lot of movements of birds. Um, and there's hopefully just going to be able to wait uh, for those things to go through uh, before they keep migrating. Um, so lots of physical constraints there. And in order to do that, um, these animals that are already remarkably engineered um, actually undergo some dramatic changes to their body in preparation for migrating. Um, so for one, just off the bat, even without any modification, bird lungs are very rigid. Um, and they're not like our lungs, which are like a deflated basketball or something. Their lungs are sort of more like, uh, think of like milk jugs. So they're kind of rigid and there are multiple milk jugs linked together. Um, and this allows birds to uh, hang out at much higher altitudes than we would, um, where our lungs would kind of collapse on themselves. Um, so some birds can uh, fly when they migrate. They can fly, you know, five, ten thousand feet um, above sea level. And some exceptional cases, uh, particularly bar-headed geese that actually migrate over the Himalayas, uh, they can sometimes top out at around thirty thousand feet, which is pretty insane. Um, but uh, birds are also able to store and metabolize fat really efficiently. Um, humans, not so much, at least me. I'll never get rid of my gut, and that's okay, because uh, I am not a bird, so I don't have to migrate long distances. But uh, birds, they actually store fat right underneath their skin like us, um, but they're actually able to burn through that stuff like jet fuel. Um, they store a lot of fat right underneath their neck and a lot more underneath their wings. Um, it's usually evenly distributed about their body so that uh, it doesn't affect uh, weight loading and all of that when they're flying. Um, over here on the right is a graph and this actually shows um, how their body, how birds bodies under, undergo changes. This is a species of grebe uh, called a black-necked grebe um, and uh, that's basically the old world version of an eared grebe I believe. Um, but anywho, uh, you can see here that prior to uh, migrating uh, things like their, uh, their breast muscles, which are used for powered flight, actually go up in size prior to um, fall migration and spring migration, fall being this left column and spring being this right column. Um, we can see that their uh, leg muscles go down uh, when, they're, when they're migrating. Uh, most importantly, you'll see that their, their, their stomach and intestines and livers actually go down in size uh, right after uh, they commence migration. Um, but you'll notice they actually boom in size prior. So that's actually so they can gorge themselves with food like crazy um, and then put on all that fat and then boom, they lose their a large portion of their stomach, intestine, and liver um, while they're migrating. It's pretty amazing. Um, and also here, heart muscles um, actually increase a bit during both of those migrations. So pretty amazing that they're able to undergo such dramatic changes. Um, I think marathon runners would be uh, pretty into doing something like that. Um, so it's pretty amazing physical modifications. Um, and then also they have amazing ways of navigating. Um, so there are a myriad of ways that birds navigate. And we now know this because we've done a whole bunch of experiments to figure this out. Um, over here we can see a, uh, an old photo of a pigeon and it's actually got an electromagnet strapped to its back and glued to its head. Uh, this was clearly before um, ethics laws were introduced to uh, uh, bird biology, but um, nevertheless uh, these electromagnets were actually used to uh, disrupt uh, the uh, orientation ability of some of these pigeons. 
Um, and it's through uh, providing a current like this that we actually knew that they're clued in to Earth's magnetic fields, which is pretty amazing. Um, lots of birds use other, other cues like topography. Um, they can use polarized light, um, which shines off of water in certain ways. Um, it's also thought that birds have, uh, are able to use auditory cues like waves crashing um, and even olfactory cues. Um, so they might smell certain things. Um, another fascinating thing is that a lot of our birds here in North America, the songbirds migrate at night. Um, and not only do they migrate at night because it's cool uh, and they don't uh, burn energy as quickly in cool weather, um, but the winds are, tend to be a bit more stable at night. There aren't as many predators out hunting at night. Um, and also, most importantly, nighttime is what reveals star patterns. Um, so we know that birds are actually able to recognize certain patterns in the night sky uh, through these really simple yet uh, elegant experiments, basically, where they put a, uh, a bird down here in a cone um, with a wire top, uh, and there's a little ink pad at the bottom and a piece of paper around the edge. Um, and when they place these out in, uh, in, uh, with just open sky, uh, these birds were actually able to orient, and you could see when they try to take off in a certain direction, um, and you can kind of average what direction they're generally taking off in. This over here on the left is what it actually looks like. Um, and then these other sort of spiderwebby looking things are like representations of what direction these birds went in. Um, so over here is when they actually, uh, this is the control, so this is when the birds are just looking at the normal night sky, this one here on the right, upper right, is actually uh, what happens when they presented the night sky in a, um, in a planetarium. So they projected the actual orientation of the night sky up there and the birds use those constellations the same way. Uh, C here is when they actually inverted the night sky on the planetarium. So they actually went the opposite direction. Uh, and then this last one over here on the lower right is when it was a very cloudy night. Um, through subsequent experiments, they actually found that birds are able to cue in on certain constellations um, and they know maybe a, up to a half dozen different constellations and that's very useful. You can imagine if there's maybe one or two clouds obscuring some of them, um, birds can still uh, orient themselves even with incomplete information. So pretty, pretty amazing. So it really wasn't until people started marking individual birds that we really figured out where the heck they go and what they're doing. Um, John James Audubon is credited with uh, being the first person to band a, a North American bird. He actually tied some silver threads to the legs of baby Eastern Phoebes that were uh, nesting in uh, his yard. Um, and according to him, they actually came back the next year. Um, Phoebes were one of his favorite birds. Um, but uh, over, over the time, that has actually evolved into uh, a normalized and regular, regulated uh, banding scheme where we actually place uh, little aluminum bands on the legs of birds, and these bands have individualized numbers on them. And if these birds are found again by someone else and reported, we basically have one record of where a bird has come from and where it went. Um, over the years, uh, I think tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of bands have been placed on uh, songbirds. And it's really through those initial efforts, um, well, actually not just songbirds, but water birds as well. Um, and it's through those efforts um, that we really sort of created these initial um, ideas of where birds actually go. Um, so at Manomet, we've been placing aluminum bands on bird legs uh, for, uh, for uh, just over a, a half a century, which is pretty amazing. Um, we've put over a quarter of a million bands on songbirds. Um, and this is basically uh, a representation of where birds have come and gone. Um, and this is just a screenshot. You guys can actually find uh, an interactive version of this map on our website. Uh, but all these red dots are birds that we banded in Plymouth, Massachusetts up here and they ended up in the red dot place and were reported. 
All the green dots are birds that were banded in the green dot place and ended up in our nets in Plymouth. Um, so some pretty, uh, some pretty fascinating birds out there. Um, some of these interesting ones uh, down here in South America, we've got a cuckoo, this is a black-billed cuckoo, very long distance uh, migrant. Uh, one in Brazil is actually an osprey that was banded um, on the Westport River. Um, so some pretty interesting birds. Uh, definitely check this out, I encourage you to. Um, but as you can see, even, even though we've banded a quarter of a million birds, uh, the return on this is pretty low. Um, you know, we maybe only have a maybe 500 or so recoveries. It's probably about two in every thousand birds um, that are ever encountered again uh, outside of our property. Um, so uh, it definitely benefits from uh, lots of effort, uh, but also even if you put that effort in, you don't necessarily get a huge complete picture. Uh, perhaps the most compelling thing that we get out of our data is that we can see that the majority of our birds stick to the East Coast. Um, and it's really through data like ours um, that we're able to piece together this idea of migratory pathways that birds are using um, throughout the, throughout the, the continent. Um, and these are, oops, I just clicked on the actual map. It's very exciting, isn't it? Okay, here we go. Okay, so we can see that these are the uh, migratory pathways. These are often referred to as flyways. Um, just think of them as, as bird flight highways. Um, and these are all the routes that birds take. Now, obviously, some of these are easier to monitor through banding than others. So you can see that at Manomet, um, the majority of our birds are sticking to the eastern flyway or the Atlantic flyway. Um, there's another flyway through the central part of the, uh, the states. Uh, depending on who you talk to, they might say there are multiples, um, but there's definitely a pattern of birds that move through the central part of the states, uh, particularly in the spring, actually. Um, and a lot of our birds um, we might see in the fall, but we don't see in the spring, things like Connecticut warblers. Um, and those are birds that uh, fly through the, uh, quite heavily through the central part of the states. Um, and then there's also um, one or two western flyways as well. Um, the Rocky Mountains are a pretty significant uh, barrier to migration, so very few birds uh, visit us from uh, west of there. Um, but it is through banding that we sort of initially came up with the ideas of these flyways. Um, these flyways aren't unique to the states or to uh, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, these are also apply to um, other continents as well. So here we've got um, a multitude of European flyways that go through the Middle East. Um, uh, there are several of them that go across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar into Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but you'll notice uh, some of the major barriers to migration are things like large bodies of water. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are certainly certain types of birds that really uh, either don't, uh, they prefer not to, or in some cases, they're just not capable of moving over water uh, or migrating over water. So um, things like uh, the Mediterranean Sea here or uh, the, um, the Caribbean uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, those are significant barriers to North American migrants. So in addition to banding, uh, there are quite a few other techniques out there um, that uh, people are really getting into. Uh, folks have been banding birds in an organized fashion since the early 1900s in Europe, um, and really since the late 1950s uh, in the United States. Um, and in, uh, throughout North America at this point, and South America. Um, but as I said, with a bird band, you're really, there are a lot of factors that you can't necessarily control. Um, whereas with some of these new technologies that folks are coming out with, um, you can actually either acquire more information on one individual, or you can get more information overall than you can just get from banding, or you can get different information. Um, so with bird banding, uh, it really is sort of ground truthing. You put nets up through the woods um, or through whatever habitat you're in, and you basically catch whatever flies into those nets. Um, with other things, there are very big picture uh, ways to study migration, like looking at birds migrating on weather radar. 
um, which is something that started around uh, World War II and when it became very important to be able to detect uh, small things on radar um, and people started noticing uh, birds on radar. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that's a great way of looking at uh, regional patterns of migration uh, or migration in relation to weather. Um, there are other individualized tracking methods um, like uh, tiny little geolocators that we'll talk about. Um, and also on larger birds, they now make uh, satellite backpacks that certain species can wear um, that uh, don't impede the bird's flight. Uh, but allow us to track birds uh, pretty much in real time, which is pretty incredible. Um, so one of my favorite things is radar ornithology. Um, and you can really observe uh, birds migrating. So this is sunset last night. And you can see the sun is setting on the east coast. And as the sun sets, you'll see these blooms of blobs around the major radar stations. And now the sun is setting across the Midwest. And these are all birds, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is something that's uh, noticeable on any uh, radar called NEXRAD radar. And if you just do a Google search for that, you can check that out. Um, I bet right now things are just starting to bloom here on the East Coast. So it's going through the loop again. And we can see these little blooms of birds taking off. And these are songbirds primarily that are taking off right as the sun sets um, and heading south at this point. You can see other things that are uh, green and yellow and uh, they, those tend to move. Uh, those, those are actually rain. So this is the uh, uh, tropical storm down here in the southeast last night. Um, but you can definitely see like over New Jersey here these are all birds taking off. Um, really pretty amazing to be able to watch it across the, across the country. Look at all the birds coming down through the boreal forest in Canada. Whew, they're loving it. Um, more locally, you can see patterns. So this was this morning. This is radar from this morning. Um, we had a little uh, uh, very fast moving line of storms come through this morning. Um, and just as the sun was coming up. And so there were birds aloft, and as this storm moved through, it's actually forcing the birds down into detectability range for the radar. Um, so right here in front of Albany, you can see that there's a little shadow of birds getting pushed down. Um, and this is actually a way for people to find concentrations of migrating birds if they're really into it. Um, another interesting thing you can notice are these rings. So this is right as the sun is coming up this morning over the Midwest. And you can see these ghosts of rings here. There's another one over here. Sort of looks like a little comma. Um, there are quite a few over Ohio. And these are actually roosts of, of day migrating birds. These are probably swallows, things like tree swallows, purple martins. Um, and swallows are diurnal migrants, so unlike a lot of their other songbird friends, they migrate during the day because they can feed on the wing. Um, and they'll roost in great numbers um, during the night, usually in marshes. Um, and these can be in the numbers of tens of thousands, even, even hundreds of thousands of individual birds. Um, and so you can imagine as these birds take off in the morning to head south, um, they leave quite a little shadow there on the radar. Um, we can see there's a big one here in southeastern uh, Indiana as well. So really kind of neat things. Uh, there are a lot of great resources online if you're interested in, in learning about radar ornithology. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty interesting thing and, and certainly something that's accessible if you're willing to put in a little bit of time reading about it. Um, pretty neat. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the birds that you might see uh, in, your, in your yard. I apologize that this is sort of uh, Eastern U.S. centric, um, but uh, I think some of the patterns here are certainly mirrored across, across, the, uh, across the continent. Um, so I want to start first off by saying that not all the birds in your backyard are migrants. 
Um, we have a lot of resident species as well. So resident species are ones that stick around all throughout the year. Um, one of the most recognizable ones in Eastern North America is the Northern Cardinal. Um, this is a species that um, has, has quite a solid bill there and their bill is really great at cracking seeds. Um, and one of the themes you'll see with a lot of the resident species in the Northeast uh, or in places that have hard winters um, is that typically if a bird's able to spend the winter somewhere, um, the vast majority of those birds are able to capitalize on uh, food resources that other birds with thinner, less powerful bills would be able to capitalize on. So in the case of cardinals, they can eat seeds. Um, something like a warbler um, or a catbird, which we'll talk about in a second, um, they're really not able to crack seeds with their bill. Um, and seeds are one of the most readily available uh, resources uh, for these things to eat and to rely upon throughout the uh, harsh winter months. Uh, I include this uh, photo in here because uh, people feed a lot of birds as well. Um, and um, we think that uh, folks having bird feeders out as well as milder winters in general have actually resulted in a, north, a pretty dramatic northward expansion of northern cardinals throughout the states. Um, so, you know, as early as a half century ago, um, cardinals were quite rare in the northeast, uh, but now they're breeding all the way up into Maine. Um, which is pretty pretty remarkable. Um, but definitely uh, this is an example of a resident species. And over here on the right I've got maps here. These maps are from um, Cornell. These are from, if you want to look up the range map of anything, uh, you can Google uh, basically the bird's name and, and all about birds um, and you can get these uh, range maps which are great. Um, so purple on this range map means that it's a year-round bird throughout that range. Here's the catbird we were talking about earlier. The great catbird is quite common throughout the, a lot of its range. It basically spans all throughout. And like I said, um, the Rocky Mountains really are um, a barrier to, to birds. So uh, these guys make it all the way to the Rockies, but not quite over typically. Um, but they breed all throughout this orange section um, and they overwinter in the blue section um, and in the purple section as well. Um, so great catbirds are a great example of a species that uh, breeds throughout a large swath of eastern North America and then uh, they migrate south uh, to Central America for the winter. Um, we would call these sort of a, a medium distance migrant. They do cover lots of ground um, but they're not, uh, they're not um, going quite as long a distance as, a lot, as some of the species we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but uh, in the uh, Fall, gray catbirds move down the coast. They're really capitalizing on berry crops, particularly um, in the fall. Um, and they uh, use this uh, pointy bill here to um, either pierce fruit or to pluck fruit off of uh, plants and scarf it down. And they're using that as fuel uh, for their southbound migration. They typically move along the coast and they're sort of funneled through Florida. As you can see, several of them will stick around in Florida, um, but then they'll sort of either hop across um, the Caribbean, some of them will overwinter in, um, in uh, Cuba and Dominica, and other ones will get all the way across uh, to the Yucatan and overwinter there. Uh, when spring rolls around, um, catbirds will actually uh, sometimes jump, uh, fly across the Caribbean, but uh, other ones will sort of move up the Gulf Coast as well. So here's a bird that is not willing to fly across water. Now this is a broad-winged hawk. Um, it's an eastern species, uh, but out west there's a species of hawk called the Swainson's hawk. Um, and both of these birds, uh, both of those species actually mix in huge numbers as they migrate through Mexico. And they really are, like Mexico is shaped like a funnel and they really are funneled through on their way south. We can see that broad-winged hawks actually overwinter as far south as um, central South America. So very long distance migrants. Um, but uh, these guys don't fly over water because they actually rely upon um, a different migra migrating strategy than uh, the catbird. When a catbird is migrating, it's basically powered flight the whole way. It's flapping nonstop pretty much. Um, whereas the broadwing hawks, 
hardly flap at all. And they rely upon uh, columns of warm air that's heated up. Uh, so as the sun uh, sort of beats down on solid ground, it forms these columns of hot air that sort of rotate up. Um, and these hawks actually spiral up each of those columns to a very, very extremely high height. And then they'll actually stoop down and soar all the way to the next one um, and do it all over again. They hardly spend any energy at all while doing this. So they really don't feed during their migration, even though they might cover several thousand miles. Um, and uh, like I said, it can be quite a spectacle if you get to a spot that's, uh, that actually funnels these guys into great concentrations. Um, and uh, there are actually a whole bunch of um, uh, places where folks uh, count these birds. Um, they're called hawk watches. Um, and there are quite a few of them all throughout the states. Um, the most famous one is probably Hawk Mountain that's in Pennsylvania. Uh, but these folks here in this photo are, you know, they're, they're kicking back uh, on top of a mountain uh, at, on a, in a Acadia National Park. Um, so they're actually watching hawks migrate past as well. You can see this background here. These are actually all broadwing hawks and Swainson's hawks um, over Mexico. Um, so pretty, pretty remarkable um, what these guys do. You can see here, which is kind of interesting, uh, there's actually a population on Cuba, um, but it's purple. So chances are some of these birds actually made it across to Cuba and they're just sticking around there. They don't want to, they don't want to leave. All right. So here is our most extreme songbird that we catch at Manomet. Um, this is a black pole warbler. Um, it, like many other species of wood warblers, um, breeds in the boreal forest, which is this section of um, uh, south central uh, um, Canada. And um, this is pretty much the nursery of, of a lot of our migratory birds. Um, it's just a really, really uh, productive place uh, for birds, but only a couple months of the year um, when insect populations really boom here. Um, and these uh, species of birds are able to feed their young copious amounts of, uh, of uh, critters. And then uh, very quickly, these birds then have to turn around and head south. Um, black pole warblers, they overwinter entirely in South America. And uh, interestingly, almost all black pole warblers, as they're migrating south, even if they're all the way west in Alaska, they'll actually come out to the east coast. So it might, they may fly 3,000 miles or more out to the east coast, where they then fatten up like crazy along the Atlantic coast. Um, and we actually catch them at the banding lab and they'll come in, a black pole warbler with no fat on it weighs about 10 grams, which is two nickels. Um, and they'll actually uh, come and scarf down on berries as much as they can. And when they take off from Manomet, they weigh about 20 grams. So they've effectively put on their entire body weight in fat. Why did they do that? Uh, that's because they're basically taking off from New England coast and heading east, southeast. Um, and they'll go out that way for a couple, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 miles, at which point they pick up the uh, trade winds, which blow towards the Caribbean. So they get a great tailwind. And these things won't actually touch down for maybe two or three days after traveling several thousand miles. Um, some will make it to the Caribbean whereas others will make it all the way to the northern coast of Venezuela. Um, at an international conference, actually, our banding director, Trevor Lloyd Evans, and I, um, we met some folks uh, who band in a, they band along this really interesting coastal uh, gap uh, in the jungle, basically, uh, right on the northern uh, edge of Venezuela, or the northern coast of Venezuela. And so they're catching all of these birds that are being funneled through these small gaps um, in these uh, uh, mountain ranges. Um, and their most commonly captured bird there is uh, Cetophaga striata, the uh, black pole warbler, which is really pretty cool. Um, so it's neat to see, uh, basically at Manomet, we're sort of one end of this epic story. Um, and these folks are actually at the other end of it, which is pretty neat. Um, a great example of, of really how migration 
um, is something that connects uh, multiple regions, uh, multiple countries, um, and multiple people together. Um, and folks may have completely different um, uh, sort of concepts of or, or perceptions of a species, um, but uh, in the end, it's all the same species. So it's kind of interesting. Um, another great example of that is shorebirds. Um, a lot of our shorebirds uh, that we have moving through here along the Atlantic coast don't actually stick around. Very few of them stick around and breed on the Atlantic coast. The vast majority of shorebirds that move through uh, the continent are actually headed up to the tundra. Um, the tundra, if you can imagine the boreal forest having a short window of time to breed, the tundra has got an even shorter period of time. Um, but the boom is so worth it for these species. Um, it's all uh, aquatic invertebrates in these kettle ponds all throughout the tundra. Um, and species like the semi-palmated sandpiper here are able to basically raise one brood, uh, always four eggs in the nest, um, and they very quickly do that because they've got a very long way to go to their overwintering sites. Um, Semi-palmated sandpipers are one of the species that scientists at Manomet have been studying. Um, and we've actually tried an interesting piece of technology um, called a geolocator on some of these semi-palmated sandpipers. So we've actually uh, captured these guys and put this tiny little tag on the leg. Uh, and this basically just looks like a little uh, hearing aid battery, essentially. Um, that's basically what it is. But what this does, it's got a tiny little computer in it that records uh, the time and it records the day length. Um, and since we know what time and what day and what latitude and longitude we put this on this bird, um, once we actually get this thing again, which I'll get to in a second, um, we can actually download the data from this and actually extrapolate out roughly where this bird is whenever it, it collects a data point. Um, but like I said, the trick is getting this geolocator back. Um, so in order to uh, get this geolocator back, you have to catch this bird again. Now keep in mind, uh, our scientists are working in some of the most remote field locations out there. They're, they're literally vying with uh, polar bears and grizzly bears for, uh, for uh, territory. Um, so being able to find the same bird in two separate years and capture it um, is quite an amazing feat. Um, but fortunately, they're putting these on adult birds and adult birds actually come back and nest in roughly the same place every year. Um, so our rate of actually getting these things back was pretty good. Um, and when we do get them back, we get some amazing information from them. So this is one of our Coates Island birds and it took off and flew basically nonstop from Coates Island all the way down here, about 6,000 miles um, to, uh, can't tell if that's Venezuela or not, but basically the northeast coast of South America. And the vast majority of semi-palmated sandpipers uh, hang out along this stretch of coast. Um, so this is Venezuela, um, Suriname, Guyana, and French Guiana. Um, and you can imagine each one of these places has different regulations. Um, in some places, uh, the species is actually hunted for, um, uh, for food. Um, and other places, it's hunted for sport. Um, so it's, it's, uh, this, is, this is an example of one species um, that's actually prone to a, a whole bunch of different um, conservation um, uh, and management issues. Um, not only that, we can see as this bird actually migrated north, it went up through the Caribbean and then decided to go all the way up the Atlantic coast. Um, we'll see that it basically stops right there at Delaware Bay, which is a major stopover site uh, for lots of shorebirds uh, and sort of the last stopover site in the spring before they head north to the boreal, uh, to the, uh, to the tundra. Um, but you can imagine at each one of these stops along the Atlantic coast, it's the spring, it's probably dealing with beachgoers all around here as it's trying to fatten up for its journey. Um, so lots of different um, hardships encountered by one species and one individual in this case. Um, an even more extreme example and some more interesting technology that um, uh, my fellow scientists at Manomet are putting on 
uh, birds are, are these satellite tags. Um, this is a, a bird, a shorebird called a wimbrel. It's, um, it's about the size of a crow, a little smaller than a crow. Um, and you can see once again, wimbrel breed up in the uh, tundra. Um, and then they kind of do the same thing where they migrate down to the maritimes and they actually scarf down berries. Um, they're thought of as pests on blueberry farms out in New, uh, Newfoundland um, and in uh, New Brunswick, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but then uh, they migrate down from uh, the Maritimes of Canada down to um, Cape Cod uh, and in the Northeast. And they actually are uh, filling up on fiddler crabs. You can barely see in this photo here, but uh, this is a wimbrel that's got a fiddler crab right in the end of its very long curved bill. Um, and this bill is great for fishing fiddler crabs out of their little dens. Um, so they actually put on a massive amount of weight and then they take off. And until we put satellite tags on these things, we weren't exactly sure um, what kind of tracks they were taking. But this is one of the tracks from one of our wimbrel. Um, so you can see it was tagged out here on the Cape. Um, in September of 2018 and it basically took off and flew out across the Atlantic and then sort of did a little bit of a readjustment and kind of did similar a similar thing to the semi-palmated sandpipers um, and all of the areas around here um, they have amazing river deltas that just uh, that, that just are distributing so much sediment from uh, the Amazon and its tributaries. Um, so those are amazingly productive mudflats, super important areas for overwintering shorebirds. Um, but this wimbrel actually took off from here and flew nonstop for 6,000 plus miles to the Gulf Coast um, before fattening up on the Texas coast and then basically flying all the way up through the central flyway to where we think it eventually um, bred up here, which is pretty amazing. Then it turned around and did the whole thing all over again. And it basically staged in the same exact spot uh, where we initially caught it. Um, so pretty amazing, um, pretty amazing movements. And it's amazing that we now have the capability of tracking individuals in this way. Um, and by doing this, we're actually learning about sites that are quite important uh, stopover sites for migration that we may have not known about um, prior to, to um, putting these location devices on these animals. But uh, yeah, pretty fascinating stuff. Um, and uh, you know, I've just barely scratched the surface here as to uh, what birds are, are doing and what they're capable of. Um, I'm sure I missed a bunch of stuff as well and you all probably have lots of questions. Uh, one of the things we would love all of you guys to do is to try to get out and uh, observe migration on your own. Um, it's actually pretty easy. It might be something as simple as stepping out in your front yard and seeing a swarm of swallows fly over. Um, there are a lot of uh, signs of migration and, and a lot of migration is happening already. Uh, like I said, there are some species that are already out of New England. Um, but one of the ways that we uh, hope that people are able to get out and observe migration um, is through our annual Birdathon, um, which is an event where people basically get out and uh, and uh, to just get out birding. Um, and this is actually an annual fundraiser for our land bird um, conservation program, uh, which includes our banding lab um, and the Massachusetts Young Birders Club, um, as well as a lot of our educational endeavors. Um, and uh, basically people get out and they participate in Birdathon by either birding or creating a fundraising team or creating a birding team. Um, and uh, reporting their sightings. Um, we're gonna have more information on this in the, in the coming weeks, um, but it is coming up. It's uh, September 19th and 20th. It's uh, 48 hours and, um, of birding fun. And this year is a little bit different than the years in the past. Um, we've had a lot of competition in the years in the past with lots of teams going out, um, but this year we really want uh, folks to be obviously practicing proper etiquette and uh, social distancing. And so we're encouraging folks to get out um, either in uh, as alone or as part of sort of their, their own bubble 
Um, and we're also encouraging people to stick close to home um, and really sort of check out your local patch or your local spot. Um, but even if you're not crazy into uh, birding or competition or anything like that, uh, we'd love for you to get out that weekend and just uh, share your experience with us. Um, you know, we'd love to know that we're uh, helping people experience migration and, and maybe see things they've never seen before. Um, so for more information, you can check out uh, manometbirdathon.com um, or you can certainly uh, reach out to me or, or um, um, some of the folks at, at Manamet as well for more info on that. But uh, for fear of going over, um, I guess we'll stop there and see if there are some questions that bubbled up. Excellent. Thank you very much, Evan. I thought that was a really fascinating uh, conversation and we do have a few questions. Uh, first up is a question from Gwen who wanted to know uh, why the birds such as warblers which winter in Central America, why don't they just stay there to breed and avoid the dangers of migration? Aren't there, isn't there enough food for them there? Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a, a fantastic question and, and one that sort of bubbles up often. Um, and it really does come, come up to opportunity. So I was talking about opportunity earlier um, and basically when spring rolls around in the Northeast, um, there are massive, massive booms of insects and invertebrates and the boreal forest is just teeming with all kinds of food um, for, for birds. Um, so it's really great nesting habitat um, for these birds and basically if, if all of our migrants stayed south where they, um, where they overwinter, um, I don't think there'd be enough uh, food down there to not only sustain um, those birds year-round but also um, allow them to get enough food for the um, energetic requirements of basically laying eggs and raising young as well. Um, so it really is this sort of boom of food and it's that opportunity uh, to capitalize on that boom of food that, that is what draws birds to migrate into these areas. Excellent. Uh, so we have another question. How often do other bird observatories or institutions contact you about Manomet banded birds that they found? Do you hear from amateurs who may have found a banded bird? Yeah, great question. We do. Um, yeah, so, so in uh, North America and into Central America, all of the folks who are banding birds um, are getting their bands from the Central Banding Office, which is a extremely tiny arm. It's really like a, it's like a nose hair of the, uh, of the federal government um, that, um, basically manages all of the bands and distributes bands to folks who are who are permitted to uh, to put bands on birds. Um, and because they manage all the band numbers, that means that um, if someone reports a band, then they're able to let us know that our band was found in a place and they actually have a centralized database of where all the birds go. Um, but yeah, the, the fact of the matter is um, a lot of the people who recover uh, and report bands are folks who are doing just what we do. Um, so we do get a lot of our recoveries from other bird observatories. Not surprisingly, um, a lot of them tend to be pretty close to us. Um, so we get a lot of um, birds from the, bird, the handful of bird observatories on the, on the Cape. Um, but we've also uh, exchanged birds with uh, New Jersey's uh, bird banding station and Kiowa Island as well. Um, and uh, as far as amateurs, lots of folks actually uh, encounter banded birds, either that are maybe injured or dead. And uh, now folks are actually, they've got cameras that are so darn good uh, that they can actually, through a few photos, they can sort of piece together a, a bird's band number even. Um, so we've actually started getting some recoveries like that too, which is pretty interesting. Excellent. Um, how's the reduction in insect populations affected bird populations? Uh, yeah, that's definitely a, that's a fantastic question. Um, yeah, and the, the, the decline in insect populations you're talking about is something that um, I think many people have observed over time, but there's very little, um, uh, there aren't a whole lot of folks who are actually just looking at um, uh, mass quantities of, of bugs like, or insects or invertebrates. Um, I gotta be PC here. Um, 
as folks have been looking at, at birds and studying birds. Um, and, uh, but the studies that have been fun, uh, going over time and looking at the magnitude of insects that are out there, all the studies agree um, that the, the number of, of insects um, are declining pretty massively and have been, have been doing so for quite some time. Um, so there is this question um, as to whether uh, the decline in invertebrate food is one of the drivers of the bird declines that, are, that we've been seeing. Um, chances are yes, um, but folks are now sort of mobilizing and trying to actually get um, empirical evidence that that is the case. And so people are able to um, uh, obviously look at current birds and seeing what they're eating, but uh, folks have actually started some interesting string of research where they're looking at um, museum study specimens of birds and you can actually get feather samples or uh, more useful, you can get like little clippings from their toenails. Um, and you can actually analyze those to look for specific isotopes that correlate with different uh, types of invertebrate food. So you can actually tell what a bird was eating, even if it's a specimen that was collected on its breeding grounds maybe a hundred years ago. Um, so folks are starting to, to compare those to modern birds to see um, if there were different invertebrate food available. Uh, but chances are, yes. Excellent. And so um, looking ahead to Birdathon weekend, what kind of species uh, might people see migrating through the Boston area or New England? Uh, yeah, during Birdathon weekend. So Manomet is really interesting in that our Birdathon is taking place during fall migration. The vast majority of Birdathons and, and birding events uh, in North America uh, take place around spring. Um, and spring migration. And it's a lot easier to encounter uh, birds when they're singing their songs. Um, but fall can also be a really amazing time of year to look for migrating birds. So by the time Birdathon rolls around in mid to late September, um, in some areas in New England, you could notice large groups of hawks flying through um, if you find a spot that concentrates them. Uh, along the coast, we still have uh, pretty decent sized flocks of shorebirds, um, particularly uh, some of the, the um, uh, young birds that are still taking their time coming down, uh, so the young of the year. Um, and then if you look in thickets and other places, you can see uh, a lot of the songbirds. So the vast majority of our songbird migrants that move through from the boreal forest, they peak in September. Uh, but then also you can encounter sea ducks that are coming down from the tundra too. So um, there are a lot of different uh, uh, groups of birds that you can encounter in the Northeast in mid to late September. Excellent. And I think we have time for one more question, uh, which came in through the chat. And it's from Julio, who wanted to know, why do some individuals stay in their wintering grounds? Um, for example, uh, he's writing to us from San Salvador and they have a peregrine falcon who has become famous for uh, staying downtown and att attacking news channel drones. And <laughs> previously they've seen some ospreys and peregrines as well. So uh, why do they stay there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, for some, uh, look, for some species, peregrine falcons, they're, they're present on pretty much every continent. Um, their name Peregrine is probably derived from that fact that they're pretty much uh, cosmopolitan. They're all over the place. Um, but individuals might actually have a pretty sweet deal where, um, you know, peregrine falcons, they migrate, but not in the same sense that something like a, a warbler would. Um, so peregrines tend to follow around food resources. Um, and it sounds like uh, besides attacking news drones that peregrine falcon probably also found uh, some pigeons or whatnot hanging around the city that it, that it can actually eat. Um, so it doesn't have too much incentive uh, to move on from, from where it is. Um, there are some species where that's actually um, a phenomenon as well, where you have sort of uh, partial migration of a species where uh, particularly in Europe, have um, uh, areas like uh, Spain 
where barn swallows actually uh, stay there all throughout the year. Um, and they have resident barn swallows that live there all throughout the year. But they also, uh, twice a year, have barn swallows that nest further north, migrate south through there on their way to Africa. Um, so you can actually have this pretty interesting uh, phenomenon where some individuals are migrating and other ones are staying around in an area that's suitable for them year round. Excellent. Well, thank you, Evan, so much for sharing your insight and knowledge with us today. And thank you everybody for being a part of this very special presentation this evening. I know many of you are longtime members and supporters of Manomet, and I just wanted to say thank you. We are very grateful for your generosity and commitment. We hope to see you again on a future webinar or as a Birdathon participant. Our next webinar is coming up on the afternoon of Monday, August 31st. Our shorebird biologist, Abby Sterling, will be presenting More Than Sand and Swimming, Georgia's Beaches as Wildlife Habitat. And you can find more information about that on our website at manomet.org. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and good night, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody.